Frankie Fish and the Sonic Suitcase by Peter Hellier A short bit before we meet Frankie Fish. One morning, an old man with a hook for a hand parks his beloved blue car outside a bakery. He shuffles inside to buy a loaf of bread and then shuffles out again a few minutes later with a bag swinging gently off his hook. Huffing and puffing along the way, the old man stops to yell at a pigeon on the bonnet of his car. The pigeon makes a deposit from its feathery bottom, which makes the old man yell even more. Grumbling about the mess, the old man opens the car door and climbs in. He puts on his seatbelt and checks his rear view mirror. Satisfied, he starts the engine. Then he drives his beloved blue car forward, smashing through the window of the bakery. Nobody is hurt. The baker is stunned. The car is totaled. The old man, now parked inside his local bakery under bricks and bread and tarts, is Alfie Fish, and this single event may change the history of the world. Why, I hear you ask? To find out, you'll have to read on. Chapter 1. When good pranks turn bad. Really, extremely, very bad. Francis Fish was excited. Make that super excited. He couldn't have been more excited than if his hands were made of chocolate. For one thing, it was the final day of school for the term, which meant that he was about to have two glorious weeks away from St Monica's Primary. Even better, in just one sleep, he would be joining his best friend, Drew Bird, and the entire Bird family at their beach house for the holidays. This meant he wouldn't have to spend the holidays as he usually did, helping out at the family business fish pest control. It also meant he didn't have to see his sister Lou, professional saint and mum and dad's absolute favourite, an accusi accusation strenuously denied by Ron and Tina Fish for 14 whole days. Win, win, double win! Francis was over the moon. He hadn't been on many holidays because his parents were generally too busy to take them and he'd never been on one with a best friend on account of never having had one before. But that had all changed when Drew Bird arrived at school last term. After Miss Merriweather had introduced Drew to the class on his first day, she said, in a decision she would soon come to regret, you can sit in the spare seat next to Francis Fish. Drew walked over and plonked down next to Francis, grinning broadly. Hiya, Frankie Fish, he said. I'm Drew, Drew Bird. For a moment, the world stopped. It was as if Francis had stepped into a sudden ray of warm sunlight. Because this is the thing, no one had ever called Francis Frankie before, let alone given him a nickname that was making fun of his fishy surname, and he immediately loved it. Francis felt a grin spread across his face. Right there and then, Francis, no Frankie, Fish, would have swum to China and back for Drew Bird. The two boys quickly discovered that they shared a lot more in common than animal birds, animal based surnames. They both loved watching Doctor Who, they were both world class spitters, and they were both awesome at pranks. Well, Frankie was pretty good at pranks. He'd once discovered St. Lou's pet turtle in post it notes, and on her birthday, he put a fake dog poo on her pillow. Classic stuff. But Drew Bird was a next level prank king. The kind of king who could set off a fart bomb in the staff room during lunchtime and walk away without a scratch, or a stench for that matter. In the short time he'd known Drew, Frankie's pranking skills had come along in leaps and bounds. Which leads us to another reason why Frankie was excited. Today, on the last day of term, he and Drew were going to play their biggest prank ever together, and it was going to be epic. Their target was the end of term assembly which usually had all the excitement of a snail at a zebra crossing and went just as slow, painfully slow. Yeah. But today's assembly would not be like that. Nope, no way. Because at today's assembly, Frank and Drew, Frank, Frankie and Drew Bird had a little surprise planned. While Principal Dawson was boring everybody into a coma, definitely medically possible, Frankie and Drew were going to release a banner behind his head that read, Happy holidays, suckers! Gold. Absolute gold. It was good, clean fun and the culmination of many hours of work. 
Drew was such a prank perfectionist that he kept altering the details. Every time Frankie thought the prank was set, Drew would turn up at school with an excited gleam in his eye and say, It's been a change of plans, Frankie. I thought of something even better. It was like Drew was a professional prankster, while for Frankie it was a hobby. In fact, Drew Bird had already mapped out his future career as a YouTube viral prankster, which was at odds with his parents' plan for him to become a chiropractor. Gary Bird had a history of chronic neck pain. It was only yesterday that they'd finally settled on the exact wording for the banner. They planned to paint it together during lunch, but they ran out of time. So in the end, Drew took the paper and paint home to do it there. Frankie's job was to organise the ropes that would unfurl the sign. As they got ready for school, Frankie daydreamed about all the fun and adventures he and Drew would have together on their holidays. Playing cricket on the sand, camping on the foreshore, and of course the pranks they would dream up. Frankie even had a brand new boogie board from his birthday that he was dying to try out. Plus, Gary Bird had promised that they'd go to an island where you could actually ride dolphins. Just one more sleep, thought Frankie happily, as he hid the ropes in the bottom of his school bag, and then I'll go on the adventure of a lifetime. At least that had been the plan, until Frankie and Drew's epic prank threw everything out the window. After heading over the ropes to Drew at the front gate, Frankie didn't see his best friend again all morning. It was only when he was filing into the end of term assembly, right behind the class prefect, Lisa Chadwick, whose perfect ponytail kept swinging into his eye, that Drew appeared. Hey, whispered Drew, pulling Frankie by the arm. Come with me. Francis Fish and Drew Bird, where are you two going? snapped Miss Merriweather. Miss Merriweather was very crotchety at the moment. The rumour in the schoolyard said that this was because she was busy organising her wedding to her boyfriend, Mr Hodge, a.k.a. the Hedgehog, the sports teacher. She'd planned the menu, she'd selected her wedding dress, she'd even chosen the cake toppers. The only thing she hadn't been able to arrange was a proposal from the Hedgehog. Drew rebounded quickly than, quicker than LeBron James. Mr. Burke asked us to help with the audio-visual equipment, he said. He said it so quickly and so confidently that Miss Merriweather believed him, even though this went against everything she knew about Drew Bird, which was, never trust Drew Bird. As everyone else found their seats, Frankie followed Drew aside around the side of the stage and up the back stairs, both of them giggling like hyenas on laughing gas. A hush came over the assembly hall as Principal Dawson took the microphone, kicking things off with a warning to the Mosey triplets not to do whatever it was they were doing. Frankie and Drew got into their prearranged positions. Frankie took hold of the rope that ran all the way up to the ceiling. The other end was tied in a knot around a large steel knob on the ground, which was usually used to secure the background scenery for the school play. <coughs> Rehearsals for next year's performance of the new school musical, Dewey, decimated, written by the overzealous librarian Miss, Dav Miss Davis, had yet to begin. Drew would be on the other side of the stage with an identical rope knot knob set up. Remember, we have to let go of the ropes together when I say now, Drew whispered. Frankie grinned and gave him a solid thumbs up, though technically it was only one thumb. Drew winked at Frankie before tiptoeing away, like a thief in the night, to the other side of the curtains. Frankie Fish could barely hide his excitement. If he'd been a real fish, his tail would have been flapping with unbridled joy. The assembly started, and it was the snooze fest Frankie had predicted. Mr Dawson started by thanking the school groundskeeper, Mr Harris, for his years of service, and wishing him luck for his retirement. Frankie, for one, was not sorry to see the groundskeeper go. Mr Harris had never forgiven him and Drew for the time they swapped the labels on the tubs of fertiliser and weed killer in the story shed just before the national. Best school grounds competition was judged. Mr Harris had sworn loudly that he'd get them back one day. Sorry, old man Harris, but your time is up, murmured Frankie, as, Dawson hand, as Mr Dawson handed the groundskeeper a watch and ushered him off stage. Mr Dawson has spent two minutes telling off the Mosey triplets for still doing what they what he told them to stop doing and gave everyone a lecture on appropriate assembly behaviour. 
Frankie could barely contain himself, yet General Bird still didn't give the signal. The assembly was going on for so long that Frankie started to worry they might miss out on a school holiday. Frankie craned his neck to catch Drew's eye. Drew signalled him to hold. The hedgehog was on stage now, going on about how proud he was of the hockey team for fighting out the year despite not winning a single game. Then he cleared his throat and hitched up his tracksuit pants. It's time to make a special end of term announcement, he said, and paused for dramatic effect. He was about to announce the purchase of new hurdles and wanted to milk it for all it was worth. Just at that moment, with a smile as wide as a soccer goal without a goalie, Frankie drew, saw Drew give the thumbs up. Now, he hissed. With a rush of excitement, Frankie Fish promptly yanked the rope. The knot slithered undone and the rope whizzed up to the ceiling. And as the banner fell, Frankie saw Drew mouthing something else at him. He couldn't be completely sure, but it looked like he was saying, There's been a change of plans. Frankie felt uneasy. Uh-uh, what had Drew done? Frankie watched, frozen to the spot, as the enormous banner unfurled right behind the hedgehog who was enjoying the suspense. Just as he was about to launch into the hurdle news, there was a scream from the audience. It was a loud and screechy scream, almost a squeal, like a mouse was loose in the auditorium, a mouse with a machete. From his position, Frankie could not see what was on the banner. He looked across to the stage to see Drew Bird grinning from ear to ear as he made the signal for let's bail before disappearing out of view. But Frankie wanted to know what was going on. There was another squeal, which sounded like it came from the same person or the same machete-wielding rodent. Frankie, confused and increasingly nervous, poked his head around the curtain that the whispers in the auditorium became louder. Everyone was staring at Miss Merriweather, who was running up the stage stairs, her hair falling loose from its bun, her face pink with joy. The girls cheered as Miss Merriweather flung herself upon a clearly baffled hedgehog and planted the biggest kiss of all time right on his lips. The boys laughed and made vomit gestures to each other but they were clearly loving the mayhem of the moment. Even the teachers were smiling and clapping, which made Frankie relax a little. Maybe he and Drew were in the clear. After all, anything that makes people cheer and laugh and smile has to be a good thing, doesn't it? Frankie slipped down from the stage and into the assembly hall, and the banner behind the hedgehog slowly came into view. As soon as Frankie saw it, his brain sent an urgent message to his mouth. This is bad, very bad. Mrs. Mary, Miss Merriweather was still smooching a bewildered hedgehog, but she told she took a break and headed, leaned over to the, grab the microphone. I do, she yelled with all the volume and passion of a teenager at a pop concert. The hedgehog could not have been more confused if you'd asked him to wash his hair with a banana. Then he finally looked up behind he him. Can't wash your, you can't wash your hair with a banana. You can't wash your hair with a banana. That's so silly. That's very silly. Um, he finally looked up behind him and got the shock of his life. In big bright letters, the banner read, Nancy Merriweather, will you marry me? This was not the message Frankie and Drew had agreed upon. Where was the happy? Where was the holidays? And where was the suckers? Miss Merriweather was jumping up and down like she'd just won an all-expenses-paid trip around the world. The hedgehog looked like he'd just found out how he had to pay for it. A beaming Principal Dawson took the microphone and said, Well, what a great start to the holidays. Have a great last day of term, everyone. As everyone show showered the happy and confused couple with congratulations, Frankie realised that he had to get away from the crime scene as quickly as possible. Maybe no one had seen him pull that rope. Maybe if he just laid low for the next hour until the final bell rang. But just as he was slipping out the hall door, a bony hand gripped his shoulder. Frankie turned to see old man Harris holding up an ancient video camera. I've had this set up and trained on stage all morning to film my farewell, he said triumphantly. And guess what else I've caught on tape? Two no good pranksters. Fish guts, you and your bird brain buddy are in so much trouble. Old people jail. 
I'm sorry, okay, said Frankie from the back seat as the fish pest control minivan pulled away from the school. I said I was sorry. Well, you'll, well, you'll go on being sorry, roared Ron Fish from the front, because you're grounded for life. Life, said Frankie, what does that mean? No TV, no iPad, and no computer either, his dad continued bellowing. If you think you're going to beach to the beach with the birds tomorrow, forget it. In fact, you're never going to see that bird boy ever again. Never, Frankie bellowed back. Never, 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 Ron Fish bellowed even louder, as if he were the world champion bellower reclaiming his championship. I've already spoken with Gary Bird, and he agrees. Your friendship is done. In an instant, Frankie's daydream shattered. His first ever holiday with a friend, trying out his brand new boogie board, riding the dolphins. Kaput, kaput, kaput. He hadn't even had a chance to talk to Drew about what had happened. Even when they'd been side by side in Mr. Dolphin's office, Drew had only been able to mutter a faint, Sorry, Frankie before everyone started yelling at them. That's not fair, he cried. Ronfish pulled the car over to the side of the road, slammed on the brakes, and turned around. It is fair that your mother is it fair that your mother and I were dragged away from work because our son reduced the teacher to tears? Is it fair that Miss Merriweather was humiliated in front of the entire school? Mm. Is that fair, Francis? Is it? Frankie crossed his arms and slumped down in the seat. Okay, fine. It wasn't fair. Francis, you're only making it worse for yourself, said a calm voice from the seat next to him. The voice belonged to St. Lou. She was two years older than Frankie and super smart, super popular and super well behaved. <coughs> this made Frankie resent her a little, and by a little, I mean a lot, especially right now. <coughs> Don't you have anything to say in your defence, demanded his mum Tina, also known as Tuna. Yes, thought Frankie sulkily. It wasn't my idea to write that message. But he couldn't say that. He and Drew had a prankster's code. They didn't rat each other out. Not ever. When Drew was blamed for itching powder Frankie had sprinkled through every open car window in the staff car park, he'd said nothing, even when he was put on yard duty for two weeks. And now Frankie was honour bound to do the same, no matter what the consequences. At that moment, Frankie wished harder than ever he'd ever wish for anything that his entire family would disappear so that he could move in with the birds and be happy forever well francis his dad thundered again he's probably in a state of shock after today lou said probably he's got PTSD or something you know like when soldiers come <coughs> home from war if anyone has ps3 it's you lou frankie snapped not realizing he's ringing his sister was trying to help yeah, well, we better get out of that state, shouted Dad as he pulled back onto the road before we get to Grandad and Nana's house. What, yelled Frankie? You can't send me there. Francis, your father and I are very busy with the pest control business, said his mum. We just haven't got time to worry about you misbehaving. No way, said Frankie, shaking his head vigorously. I'm not going. That place is like old people jail. Well, I guess that'll make you its youngest prisoner, said Ron Fish, glaring into the rearview mirror at Frankie, who looked like he'd just swallowed a fart. Because you'll spend the whole school holidays there, starting tomorrow. The following day, the Fish Pest Control minivan was as silent as a church service for mice. Frankie glared out the window as he drove. As they drove, he hated visiting his grandparents. It wasn't just that it was boring, although it definitely was. Nana and Grandad, also known as Mavis and Alfie Fish, were basically living in the Dark Ages, with only one TV and no computers. The only vaguely modern thing in their house was Nana's electric can opener, which she thought was a bit whiz, all a bit whiz-bang. Frankie thought it might have been because they lived in Scotland before they came to Australia. Maybe people in Scotland didn't have the internet and computers and stuff like everyone else. The real problem, in any case, was Grandad Alfie Fish, the grumpiest, sourest, meanest old man in the history of mean old men. He made old man Harris look like the Easter Bunny. Grandad barely spoke to anyone besides Nana, preferring to spend almost all his time in the shed at the bottom of the garden, where no one else was allowed to go. It didn't help that Grandad had a hook instead of a right hand, 
which Frankie, which Frankie secretly thought was a bit creepy. He knew he shouldn't, but he did. Annoyingly, nobody would tell him how Grandad had lost his hand in the first place. It was just never spoken about. Like Miss Davis's moustache or Principal Dawson's 90s cover band, the Matchbox, Blossom, Matchbox, Matchbox Blossoms. So Frankie Fish was left to draw his own conclusions. A. Grandad's hand was bitten off by a shark. B. Grandad was actually Luke Skywalker in disguise. C. Grandad had high-fived Edward Scissorhands and come off second best. Frankie had once prayed that it was B. Frankie loved Nana Fish okay because she loved kids, had sparkly blue eyes and made good pancakes. But visiting Frankie's grandparents was like sitting down to a bowl of ice cream when there's a plate of rotten meat beside you. Sure, ice cream is nice, but it's hard to enjoy when there's the stench of putrid fish in your flesh, drink flesh in your nostrils. Frankie's mum turned around from the front seat of the car. You know your granddad lost his driver's license recently, she said. You can help your grandparents out by running errands. You could re they could really use an extra hand around the place. At any other time, Frankie might have laughed at the accidental joke, but today he couldn't even master a smirk. His not a smirk soon dropped, drooped even lower as the fish family minivan pulled into the long driveway. They'd arrived at Old People Jail. Dad, I'm sorry, okay? Frankie said desperately, trying to sound extra sorry. You've made your point. Now let's go home. But Ron Fish gave Frankie a look and then honked twice. Be good, Francis, said his mum, turning around to give him a squeeze. St. Lou gave her brother a sympathetic look, which Frankie misinterpreted to mean, Suck eggs, loser. Aren't you coming in? He said to his family, trying to keep a wobble out of his voice. Maybe if they were reminded how boring it was at Nana and Grandad's, they'd realise this was a ridiculously big punishment. Maybe he'd even be allowed to go away with Drew after all, or at least be able to call him. But Tina and Ron weren't falling for that. Help Nana around the house, his mum said, and stay out of Grandad's way. And remember, do not go near his shed. A moment later, Frankie was left standing in the driveway as his family's minivan screeched off like they'd just robbed a bank taking his dreams with them. Chapter 3. A moment of madness in a mad, mad place. Five minutes later, Frankie sat down on Nana's couch with his boogie board, which he'd brought just in case. His jail sentence felt very harsh, especially when he thought of all the fun he should have been having at the beach. He tried very, very hard not to cry and bravely succeeded. Frankie could hear Nana humming in the kitchen as she prepared morning tea. Grandad was sitting in his armchair with a newspaper open in front of him. He turned a page, ignoring Frankie completely. Frankie stared at Grandad for a moment, and then the painting above his head. It was of dogs playing poker, and he hung on that wall for as long as Frankie could remember. He didn't find it particularly funny, but perhaps Grandad did. Dogs playing poker, he said meekly. Classic. Grandad didn't even move his head to acknowledge the comment. After another long silence, Frankie decided to start again. Um, hi, Grandad, he tried. What's in the news today? Anything good? Silence. Grandad turned another page. Did you know that you can read a newspaper on a computer these days? That might be easier on your hook because um, you don't have to turn pages on a computer, Frankie went on politely. Yeah, we all use computers now. Do we even know what a computer is? More silence. A frown deepened across Grandad's forehead. Frankie cleared his throat. It occurred to him that it had been a while since he'd seen his Grandad, and it was possible that he'd gone deaf since then. Frankie increased the volume. Grandad, I said. Suddenly, Grandad stood up and glared at Frankie. Then he scratched up his newspaper and slammed it on the table which would have been very dramatic and scary, except that several of the pages got stuck on Grandad's hook and he had to wave the hook around wildly to get them off while the sports section flapped about like a pelican in a bathtub. Frankie froze, not even daring to snicker. Grandad finally freed the crumpled newspaper from his hook, banged it on the table and stomped out of the room. A moment later, Frankie heard the back door slam. 
without even noticing he let go of his boogie board which was fast becoming the saddest boogie board in the world so began frankie's school holidays the one good thing about his grandparents' home was that it was clean and spelt nice. No thanks to Grandad fish guts. The floors were regularly mopped, the polka dot curtains framed spotless windows, and the aroma of blueberry pancakes wafted through the air. Another plus was that Grandad, Captain Hook, spent most of his time in the shed. But it was frustrating that no one else was ever allowed to take so much as a peek inside. What if you were being attacked by zombies? No, stay out of Grandad's shed. What if you were being attacked by zombies with axes and guns and girl germs? No, stay out of Grandad's shed. What if you desperately need to do a poo and the last roll of toilet paper in the whole world was in Grandad's shed? No, find a newspaper and stay out of Grandad's shed. Of course, being forbidden entry just made Frankie more curious than ever. What does Grandad do all day in that shed? He asked Nana, as she brought over a bag of marbles. I'm not really sure, dear, admitted Nana. He tinkers mostly, I think. Whatever it is, it keeps him busy and out of my hair. She winked as Frankie's eyes darted up to her purple hair. Nana didn't seem to mind keeping Frankie in her hair, though, which was lucky, because it wasn't like there was anywhere else he could go. There was nothing for Frankie to do but play marbles, Listen to talk back radio and watch game shows on the little TV that Nana loved so much. Sometimes he laid his boogie board on the lounge carpet and tried to pretend he was riding a dolphin at the beach with Drew Bird. Nights overtook mornings and mornings overtook nights as Frankie's sentence ticked away and one thing remained the same. He was bored out of his brain. <laughs> And then late one afternoon, just as Nana sat down with a cup of tea for another episode of Family Feud, Frankie decided enough was enough. He sneaked into the hallway and picked up an, an, the ancient landline. A chirpy Ron Fish answered the phone. Fish pest control. If there is a pest, we'll do the... Hi, Dad. It's me, Frankie. Frankie? Yeah, your son. Hey, Francis, Ron said, sounding more normal. How are you enjoying Nana's? Frankie took a deep breath. Look, I was just wondering if I could come home, he said politely. I've been here for a very, very, very long time now. His dad groaned loudly. So much for customer service, thought Frankie. Mate, it's been 48 hours, his dad said. Don't call us at work unless it's an emergency, okay? We need to keep the line free. Your mother will come and get you when we're ready. Click, the phone went dead. Click, the phone went dead, and so too did Frankie Fisher's hopes of early release. Frankie dragged himself back into the lounge as the Murphy family on the TV tried to think of another thing you might do with a zucchini. Um, use it to clean your ear, suggested Mrs Murphy. Frankie slumped in onto the coffee table, feeling the weight of his sentence on his shoulders. Near his head was a little vase of blue flowers. He stared at it glumly. Nana's bright eyes twinkled as she looked at him. Do you know what those flowers are called? She asked, turning down family feud for a moment. Frankie shrugged. Blue roses? Mostius silvacatus, Nana Fish said. Oh yeah, that was my next guess, replied Frankie sheepishly. Nana plucked a single flower from the vase. Otherwise known as forget-me-nots, she said popping it in Frankie's shirt pocket. Um, thanks, Frankie replied, not sure what he was going to do with a flower. Then, just to make conversation, and even though he knew the answer already, he said, Where's Grandad? Nana looked at Frankie, a smile tugging at her lips. In the shed, most likely. Then she sighed. He's been spending a lot more time in there lately. He's been a little grumpy, too. Have you noticed that? Um, said Frankie. He wanted to say that Grandpa was never not grumpy, but he didn't want to hurt Nana's feelings. Not really, he said, carefully. He seems the same as always. Nana closed her eyes for a moment. Losing his driver's license was a big deal for your granddad, she said quietly. He loved driving his whole life, even after the terrible accident that cost him his can. Frankie held his breath. Could this be the moment where he finally found out what happened to Grandad's hand? 
Not even St. Lou knew that. Frankie would have had bragging rights forever. What accident? Frankie asked, not wanting to sound too keen. Has he crashed into other bakeries before? Or was it a butcher's? Nana shook her head. You will never guess. Not in a million years. Was Grandad a pirate? Frankie guessed enthusiastically. Was he made to walk the plank and had his hand eaten by a crocodile? Best theory ever. But then Nana looked at the clock on the wall and said exactly what Frankie was hoping she wouldn't say. Whoops, it's late. I've got to serve up dinner. She gave Frankie another bright smile, though he thought her eyes looked a little moist. You go tell Grandad to his face. But if he isn't sitting at this table in 30 seconds, he's not having any dinner at all. But he's in the shed, protested Frankie. I'm not allowed in there. Just knock and call out his name then. That should do it. Okay, Frankie said, unconvinced. He had headed outside, past the roses and daffodils, through Nana's beautiful garden, which truly really was like Disneyland for bees. He walked past the sunflowers and the forget-me-nots, down the brick path to the shed. He felt like a golden retriever, but instead of receiving, retrieving a tennis ball, he had to bring back a cantankerous, crusty old man. A tennis ball would have been way more fun and much less angry. <coughs> the back of the garden seemed dark and ominous, though that was maybe just the shade of the leafy maple tree hanging overhead. With every step, Frankie's feet grew heavier. He arrived at the shed door, and his palms sweaty and his hands beat, his heart beating. Frankie had never been within two metres of the shed before, so it felt like a historic moment. If he'd had his dad's iPhone with him, he would have taken a quick selfie to mark the occasion. Knock, knock. Grandad, Nana said, if you don't come now, you won't get any dinner. He said it quickly, ready to run if the old man yelled at him. No response. Frankie repeated himself, this time louder and slower. Still nothing. Frankie felt himself get a little bolder. He banged on the door a few times. Grandad, Nana said if you don't come now, she'll let the neighbour's cat wee in your cornflakes. Nothing. He thumped the shed door hard. Grandad, Nana said if you don't come now, she'll wash your clothes in gravy and then roll them in seeds so you get attacked by pigeons on your morning walk. Frankie yelled at a volume that could be heard four blocks away. Nothing. Frankie was really annoyed now. He hated being ignored by the kids at school, and he hated being ignored at home even more. But at this moment, there was nothing worse than being completely ignored by Grandad. Grandad! Frankie yelled, and then in a moment of utter madness, going against everything he knew to be good and wise and holy, he pushed open the door and stomped inside the forbidden shed. Chapter 4. The Shed of Secrets Frankie was breathing heavily, his shoulders bobbing up and down like beach balls lost at sea. He couldn't believe that he was actually inside, but totally out of bounds, not even in a zombie acopolis shed. But where was Grandad? Frankie gulped as he hung nervously near the doorway. Grandad, he said softly, just in case the old crank was hiding. He knew he should probably get out of there, but this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity by like kicking the winning goal at the World Cup or eating ice cream for breakfast. So Frankie decided to take a sneaky peek around. He felt like Neil Armstrong arriving on the moon. One small step for Frankie Fish and one huge leap for fish kind. Inside the shed was dark and dusty. Frankie crept in stealthily like he was attempting to steal jewels from around the Queen's neck while she slept. The dusty floorboards creaked under his feet and with every sound his heart raced a little faster. In the centre of the shed he stopped and waited impatiently as his eyes adjusted to the gloom. Finally he would get to see what his grandfather kept hidden in there. Hmm, spare parts from dishwashers and car engines adorned the benches, alongside jars brimming with rusty screws. Frankie sighed. Total bummer. This was the biggest anticlimax since the top deck of the double-decker bus was ruled out of bounds on the double-decker bus excursion because of Miss Merriweather's fear of heights. Taking a deep breath, Frankie snuck even deeper into the shed. Maybe the good stuff was right at the back. There were no moon craters or alien life forms to be seen. 
just wonky shelves lined with dusty trophies, frayed ribbons and faded certificates, as well as some dog-eared black and white photos of a car race. Frankie leaned closer to examine the blown-up photograph of the dashing young driver, leaning against a number 42 racing car, his right hand raised in a cheerful wave. The man looked strangely familiar. Squinting, Frankie read the faded lettering in the photo's white border. Alfie Fish, Glasgow, 1950. What the? The blonde bombshell next to the race car was Frankie's own granddad. He looked so different, fit and healthy and weirdest of all, happy. A strange feeling burbled inside Frankie Fish. This guy was cool. In another photo, Frankie held up a huge trophy of two smiling women in stiff old-fashioned dresses, pouring a bottle of champagne over him. Frankie knew that if he tried that, he'd be in big trouble. But in the photo, Alfie was beaming. At the back of yet another shelf was a photo of an old man in a trench coat leaning into young Alfie's race car. The writing on the border said, Ernest gives me last minute instructions. Frankie wasn't exactly an expert on the fish family tree, but he knew his great grandparents' names were Ernest and Edna. He examined the image closely. Ernest had hands the size of Christmas hams and a smile as wonky as a day old donkey. Behind the car was another figure. A boy who looked a lot like Alfie, only smaller. Could this be his granddad's mysterious brother, the one no one ever spoke about? Frankie scratched his forehead. Was he called Robbie? Ronnie? No, Roddy, that was it. Roddy was staring at Alfie like he thought he was the greatest person ever. But Alfie was paying him no attention. I know how that feels, thought Frankie bitterly. Returning the photo to the shelf, Frankie caught sight of something yellow sticking out of a book. Carefully, he took the book off the shelf. Gravitational space, the mechanics of time travel, it said on the cover, and removed delicate, two delicate pieces of paper. The first was a newspaper clipping, headed, Big race ends in big tragedy. Frankie read aloud to himself, One thing is certain, the championship of 1952 will be remembered not for reigning champion Clancy Fairplay taking the chequered flag, but for race leader Alfie Fish skidding through an oil mark on the final turn and tragically crashing. Reports emerged that it had cost him his right hand and maybe even ended his boyhood dream. Right there and then you could have knocked Frankie down with a three quarters of a feather. Without even meaning to, he'd solved the mystery of the missing hand. Frankie's eyes were drawn back to the image of young Alfie proudly catching the trophy. Poor Grandad, thought Frankie. The other piece of paper was just an old advertising flyer, depicting a man with a pencil-thin moustache and a cape, hand-drawn in black ink. The amazing Fredo, with his fierce stare and dramatic hand gestures, seemed to be summoning words that appeared in puffs of smoke. The artist had drawn electrical bolts flying in and out of a wonky looking cube. It was the kind of cheesy old thing that Frankie was sure Drew would get a kick out of. He slipped it in his pocket next to the forgotten forget-me-not. When, if he ever got to see his friend again, he'd show it to him. It was only when Frankie was about to leave the shed that he noticed the ruby-coloured suitcase sitting open on an adjacent bench. Usually, a suitcase on a bench in a shed wouldn't be of much interest, but considering the startling developments of the past few minutes, Frankie sensed that it might not be your regular run-of-the-mill suitcase. Frankie edged closer and peered in. He wasn't sure what he was expecting to see. Spare hand hooks, maybe? But he definitely wasn't expecting a computer. Well, a sort of computer. It was a hybrid of an old clunky laptop and a typewriter, connected with hundreds of tiny wires and held together with ocky straps. Unbelievable, thought Frankie, as all the sympathy he'd been feeling melted away. He'd been secretly using a computer this whole time. Could he be any more selfish? He took a closer look. The computer, if it could be called that, had a small screen set into the lid. The suitcase itself was quite impressive. Leather handles, a hard case, and tiny monograms that Frankie could only just make out as HT. 
There was a soft whispering noise behind him, and Frankie whipped around, his heart beating madly. But no one was there. He knew Grandad would come back any minute. If Frankie was going to snoop around, he'd better hurry, and the main thing was to find out if this computer had internet. Maybe he could get a message to Drew Bird. Frankie went to press enter on the DIY keyboard, but something very strange happened. His finger went straight through the button and hit the wooden bench. It was only now that Frankie noticed the computer appeared to be shimmering slightly in the dusky light. A message that was very funny. Mm. It was a full hand computer. Mm. A message popped up on the screen in blinking green letters. The time computer is temporarily inactive as operation remains in progress. Frankie frowned. Sure he was being tricked somehow. It was bad enough that Grandad was, Jan, Grandad was a jerk. But for him to be a jerk who was playing a prank on Frankie, that was too much. Frankie and Drew were the prank kings. And nobody pranked the prank kings. Two can play at this game, old man, thought Frankie. Nana Fish wouldn't like Grandad disappearing around dinner time. Not one bit. Carefully closing the shed door behind him, Frankie hurried down the brick path towards the house. He was so keen to dob on Grandad that he failed to notice the pretty flowers that had been growing in Nanny's garden were now weeds. If Frankie had been paying more attention, he'd have also noticed grasshoppers the size of soft drink cans were hopping around where the forget-me-nots were only minutes, only minutes earlier. Nana! Frankie yelled as he burst into the kitchen. I can't find Grandad. I think he's fled the country. But there was no sign of Nana. Not only that, but the house had completely changed. It was just as if Nana had never lived there. Now Frankie Fish was paying attention. What happened? Mm, chapter 5. The Mysterious Disappearance of Nana Fish. Frankie did a double take. He had walked into Nana Fish's house, hadn't he? Yes, of course he had. The brick path he had danced down was the same, and the back entrance had the same fly wire screen door, except now it had a hole in it and was acting as a revolving door for flies and mosquitoes. It was the very same house in which he spent the last few days lying around in utter boredom. But he also wasn't. Nana, he called, darting from room to room. Nana was nowhere to be found. There wasn't any trace of her. In the lounge room, Nana's bright polka dot curtains had been replaced by a wrinkled brown pair that were drawn tightly closed, even though it was still light outside. The scent of home cooking had gone, and a stale funk lingered instead, as if the windows had never been opened. Beneath Frankie's sneakers, Nana fr Nana's freshly mopped floors were now crusted with a thick layer of old dirt. Frankie started to feel a bit scared. What's going on? he said aloud to the dark house. He hurried to the phone. His dad had told him only to call home in an emergency. But surely a missing Nana and a weirdly different house qualified as one. Ring, 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 ring. A bored sounding man answered. Hello, this is Max's Fish and Chips. If you need dinner, we've got a... Hello, is Tuna Fish there? Asked Frankie, his voice quivering. Uh -huh, very funny, the unfamiliar man said. Are you just making a prank call or do you want some fish and chips? D Dad? Frankie said, almost whispering. The man snorted and hung up. Frankie put down the phone, his hand trembling. What was going on? Mavis! Mavis! It was Grandad bellowing from outside. And for the first time ever, Frankie was relieved to hear it. The back door swung open and Grandad's voice became louder and more urgent. Mavis! Frankie walked into the grimy kitchen, feeling as though his feet were on backwards. A flustered-looking granddad was standing there, gaping at the funky smell, the darkness, the ugly curtains, the very changes that Frankie had gaped at too. A small part of Frankie was relieved that someone else was seeing this too, and he wasn't going crazy. But a much larger part of him wished that that someone else involved was anyone but his granddad. Mavis, granddad said again, more worried this time. He finally noticed Frankie, and for once he didn't glare. Have you seen Nana? She's not here, Frankie said numbly. Grandad, what's going on? The Grandad just stood there, terror written all over his face. Oh dear Lord, he whispered. Frankie was properly scared now. Please, Grandad, he said. 
Nana's gone, and then I tried to call my parents, but the phone number is different, and suddenly Frankie remembered the peculiar computer in the suitcase, the message saying, Operation remains in progress. The hairs on Frankie's neck stood up, his neck stood up like the national anthem was being played. Did you do something to Nana? Did you make her go away? How dare you accuse me, spat Grandad, but he looked guilty. Something shifted inside Frankie. He went from feeling scared to angry. Grandad had obviously done something to Nana, maybe even erased her. As Mrs. Mer Miss Merriweather would say, it warranted a rise in tone. <clears throat> this has something to do with that weird computer in your shed, doesn't it? Frankie said, his voice loud and weirdly <clears throat> high. I saw it, Grandad, and I know something weird is going on. Been snooping in my shed, have you? Lord Grandad. Not another word from you, boy. Just stop. He snapped and thrust his hand in front of him like a police officer directing traffic. And indeed, Frankie did stop, but not because his granddad had ordered him to. No, Frankie was beyond listening to the old man's orders at this point. It was because the right hand granddad was holding up was his right hand. Alfie Fisher's right hand, which had been missing for more than 50 years, was back. Frankie went back to being scared again. What? Where, where, where's your hook? He stuttered. You need to be quiet and let me think, Grandad said, running his hands through his thinning hair. Just shut your... What have you done? Frankie pleaded. Why is everything suddenly different? Where is Nana Fish and your hook and my parents? Alfie Fish was clearly about to unleash another verbal barrage on Frankie when he suddenly stopped himself, lowered his hands and took a step closer to his grandson. In a very different tone, he said, Oh my, your face! And inspected every inch of Frankie's face as if he was trying to spot spinach between his teeth and up his nose and in his ears. He leaned back to pull open the curtains and let the fading evening light fill into the kitchen and then stared at Frankie again. Your face! He repeated with concern. My face? What about your face? Frankie said defensively. It's old and wrinkly. Never mind, muttered Grandad to himself. I need to go back. Go where? asked Frankie. Never mind. Never mind? I do mind, yelled Frankie. You're just a kid, Grandad shot back. You don't know what you're dealing with. At that, Frankie lost it. And you're just a crazy mean old man who somehow messed up everything and made Nana Fish disappear and turned my family into a fish and chip shop. So whoever is your... You, whoever it is you're going, old man, I'm coming too, he screamed at the top of his lungs. There was a very loud pause that if you had gone any longer, could have lasted for its own spot on the calendar. Frankie braced for impact. Grandad grabbed Frankie by the arm, dragged him out of the kitchen, through the back door and down the back garden path. Frankie barely had time to ask. Where are we going? Before he was back inside the forbidden shed, which appeared to be less and less forbidden by the minute, with the door slammed shut behind them. Hey you, want to find out how Grandad got his right hand back? Why Nana Fish had disappeared? And where Frankie and his Frankie Pants Grandad are going next? You'll have to get your hands on Frankie Fish and the Sonic Suitcase when it hits the shelves. If you keep laughing in the meantime, visit www.frankiefish.com.au for hilarious videos and cool sneak peeks, plus special bonus content from me, Peter Hellier. Another one. If you'd like to read more with us, we've got plenty more books we'd love to share with you. And hit subscribe below. Thank you.